Yes, thank you so much for having me. And I really, you know, I am there in spirit. I wish I was there in person, but like I said, I was at Newark Airport for 12 hours yesterday until they finally canceled my flight, but they decided to hang on to my luggage, which I checked. So I'm without a bag, but I am not there in Santa Cruz. But um, I really wish I could have been there. And I'm excited to finish this, what has already been a pretty fascinating session. And I'll tell you about these interstellar interlopers and dark comets, these really exciting and mysterious small bodies that we've seen throughout the inner solar system just in the last couple of years. So first I'm gonna, this is the outline of my talk. First, I'll tell you about the first two interstellar interlopers, Amuamua and Borisov. And then I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about these dark comets, which are these mysterious objects that we've seen native to the solar system. So these are solar system objects, but have some of the same mysterious properties as Amuamua that we just discovered in the last couple of years, uh, excuse me, last couple of months. And then I'll end by talking about the future prospects for detecting interstellar interlopers and dark comets with the forthcoming LSST. So the story really starts back in 2017 when the first interstellar interloper, Amuamua, was discovered. This is the minor planet electronic circular that announced the discovery of the object. And you can see in the fine print, the eccentricity is about 1.2, which means that it's a hyperbolic trajectory. And they said this could be the first clear case of an interstellar comet. And so this, what I'm showing you here is what that hyperbolic trajectory looked like. So on the top right, you see a zoom in of Muamua's trajectory in red. And you can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor here. I, it looks like that's popping up. You can see that's where Muamua was, was discovered when it was closest to Earth. And then this is what the trajectory looks like when you zoom out into the outer solar system. And as opposed to the solar system object trajectories, which are bound and circular, Muamua's trajectory is hyperbolic. So it came and went. And it's never coming back. And that's how we know that it formed outside of the solar system. And immediately it was a global media phenomenon. These are just a few of the news articles I grabbed from the weeks after the discovery of Oumuamua. And it was so exciting because for the first time, we had the chance to look at something up close that definitively formed outside of the solar system, a macroscopic object that is. And it was also a global scramble because the object was very rapidly moving and fading very rapidly. So what I'm showing you here are every, every position in the, on the Earth that we got ground-based observations of a Muamua. And it was only observable really for a couple of weeks. And another reason it was so exciting was that in every way that we expected the object to behave, that we thought that an interstellar comet, how it should behave, a Muamua acted the exact opposite. So the first mysterious property of the object was that it had no extended cometary tail. This is a deep stacked image that Dave Jewett took with the Nordic Optical Telescope. You can see a Muamua in the center here. And clearly, there is no extended cometary activity, which typically you see on solar system comets when they get close to the sun because they have volatile icy material, which heats up, sublimates, produces an outflow of gas, and there's usually dust in that gas that reflects optical photons producing those beautiful cometary tails. So Oumuamua not only had no cometary tail, but it had very dramatic brightness changes. So what I'm showing you is this remake of the light curve I made. So the y-axis is the corrected magnitude. So remember magnitude, astronomers use magnitude, that's a log scale for the brightness. And then you can see these on the x-axis is the time. It was only really observable for a few weeks. You have the only good data was taken for a couple of days in October and then a few observations in November. But you can see that Muamua is going from bright to dim somewhat periodically. But this is corresponds to about a factor of 12 in brightness variations. And now you could explain that if a Muamua was an object that was elongated and tumbling. So as it was passing by the Earth in its orbit, it was also tumbling around its own axes. And what you see is that as it tumbles, you see edge on versus head on projections of the surface area. But to get a factor of 12 to 1 in brightness changes at that geometry, you need an aspect ratio of about 6 to 1, which is more extreme than anything that we've seen in the solar system that formed naturally before. 
And then to make matters even weirder, it had a very significant non-gravitational acceleration. So what that means is that if you take all of the data that we know of the positions of a Muamua throughout its trajectory, you cannot explain that trajectory just from the sun's gravitational influence. There must have been an additional force that pushed the object away from the sun. And it's very important to note that we see and measure non-gravitational accelerations on comets and asteroids routinely. In fact, the non-gravitational acceleration of a Muamua was completely in line with non-gravitational accelerations we see on comets. What's happening is that the outgassing that causes the dust tail will push a comet away from the sun or in other directions. But the weird thing is that we didn't see any cometary tail. So there was no dust surrounding a Muamua's, surrounding a Muamua in the deep images. So Jenny Bergner and I published this paper in Nature just a few months ago, where we demonstrated that all of these mysterious properties of a Muamua could be explained if you consider that it was a water rich planetesimal that was ejected from another stellar system that exhibited radiolytically produced H2 within amorphous water ice. So what happened is that this water rich comet presumably was traveling through interstellar space and in the interstellar medium exposed to the galactic cosmic rays. And what these galactic cosmic rays would do in high energy radiation, we've seen stuff like this happen in laboratory experiments here on earth. It first produces takes the crystalline water ice and produces amorphous water ice. And then you'll get radiolytically produced H2 entrapped within the amorphous ice matrix. And then as a Muamua enters the solar system, the amorphous ice will heat up to the point where it crystallizes and thereby expels the radiolytically produced hydrogen. And that would also explain why there is no dust, because if the water ice itself is not sublimating, you wouldn't produce, you wouldn't expel the entrapped dust production. And at this point, I also just want to say that while there are lab experiments that support the hypothesis that Jenny and I published, we're really at a position with these kind of intriguing objects that are right on the edge of activity that we know of in the solar system and can understand. It's really time to do some more, some significant improvements to some of our lab experiments is to explain these interstellar objects. So one thing that would be very important is that we would need thicker ices that also include dusts in, mixed within the ices. And if you, they were thicker and you made the, expose them to high energy radiation and heated them up, you could then quantify really how much H2 you could make in amorphous ice. And if you could produce low levels of dust consistent with a Muamua's trajectory. So while we're waiting for LSST, I think there's a lot of exciting stuff that we can do in the meantime. Now, the second interstellar comet was discovered to I Borisov just two years after Muamua. So again, this is one of Dave's images of taken with the Hubble Space Telescope of Borisov on the right. And it's, it's quite a stark contrast to Muamua. You can see that this image of Borisov is clearly a different regime of object. You have this very extended cometary tail. And the great thing about Borisov was that it was discovered. I'm showing you where it was discovered here on the right. And then that it was observable from the Earth for almost a year. So we had almost a year to get very detailed compositional measurements and dust measurements, remote dust measurements, that told us about how Borisov was, was acting in comparison to solar system comets. And it turns out that Borisov is quite different than a lot of the solar system comets that we have measured and measured production rates for. And it's been very interesting and told us a lot about planet formation. But clearly, this object is different than a Muamua, which acted very mysteriously. So now I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about these recent objects that we discovered, these native solar system objects, these dark comets. We only published the papers announcing their discovery a few months ago. And it's I really want to make the point that these objects, we while they share some of the mysterious properties of a Muamua, we do think that they are a different type of object, but it's still something mysterious that we can't explain currently with our current theories and need follow-up observations, potentially in situ observations, to get a handle on what's going on. So there are these seven near-Earth objects we discovered that also, like a Muamua, have significant non-gravitational accelerations without any detectable cometary activity. 
So the two papers outlining the seven objects are down here on the left. Davide Farnokia is at JPL. He led one of them and I led one of them. They were just published a few months ago. And on the left is the image of one, a deep PanStars stack of images. PanStars is the survey that discovered a Muamua. And then on the right, that's for 2003 RM. On the right is this object KY26. And KY26 is kind of my favorite of the dark comet objects. It's interesting for a lot of reasons. So it's very small. It's actually 15 meters in radius. And it's rotating extremely rapidly. So about every 10 minutes, it does a full rotation. And it's so faint and small. This is deep VLT images that we published. And you can see, you could in the red is outlining where K KY26 is. And you can see that it's barely visible. But not only is it barely visible, there is no extended cometary tail around either of these objects. Yet we have measured these very significant non-gravitational accelerations. And so... Bear with me here. This is going to be the most technical part of the talk. And I'm going to tell you a lot about non-gravitational accelerations and what we know about non-gravitational accelerations, how they act on asteroids and comets. I mentioned that you met, we have measured non-gravs on comets and asteroids before. And typically what's going on is when you have comet for a comet, when you have cometary material, which is sublimating, that produces a net change in momentum of the object. And so A1 is the radial acceleration. That was what was observed on a Muamua. That's away from the sun in the antisolar direction. And now it's also important to note that we measure radial accelerations on asteroids that are inactive routinely. But these radial accelerations on asteroids are much weaker than what we've seen on the dark comets and on a Muamua because that is caused by radiation pressure from the sun. And it's a very weak minute effect. There's also transverse acceleration shown here. That's A2. That's in the orbit plane. And those are also can be measured on asteroids because that's caused by what's known as the Yarkovsky effect. And the Yarkovsky effect is simply when an asteroid absorbs solar photons and then re-radiates thermally. You have a net acceleration. Again, that is a quite weak feature. And then a3 is the direction which is out of the orbit plane. So that's only explainable by polar events. And we really don't see that on asteroids and comets very often. Now, this is, I said this was the most technical point, part of the talk, and this is the most technical plot of the talk. So bear with me. On the x-axis of this plot, I'm showing you h magnitude. So that is the brightness, the log scale brightness. And that corresponds to a size of an asteroid. So typically, the size I'm showing you up here, we're talking about objects which are subkilometer in scale. And then on the y-axis, I'm showing you the magnitude of accelerations. So in blue, these are asteroids that have measured non-gravitational accelerations. And all of these are A2. So that's transverse acceler accelerations explained by the Yarkovsky effect. And they scale. We know the Yarkovsky effect should go over one over the size of the nucleus. So these objects all act exactly like we would expect. Now, the pink points are radial accelerations we've measured on inactive asteroids. And these, again, are caused by radiation pressure. And the seven diamonds here are the dark comets for which we've measured significant A3 and A2. And the fundamental point is that these, can, these A2s cannot be explained by the same thing causing these A2s because they are much too strong. And then, although they are comparably strong, to what radiation pressure will do in A1, it's in the wrong direction. So we're measuring these non-gravitational accelerations on these objects, mostly in the polar direction, out of plane. And we think that this is somehow due to outgassing activity without any related dust activity. But we don't really know what's going on. It's completely mysterious. But excitingly, 1998 KY26, you could probably see now why this is my favorite one of the objects. It is already the target for the JAXA Hayabusa 2 extended mission. So by 2031, we will have in situ measurements, much like Osiris Rex had on Bennu, we will have in situ measurements that are capable of imaging the surface, but also measuring dust and outgassing. So we will know exactly what is causing this. And this may shed light on the first interstellar interloper, or Muamua. So I'm going to end the talk by talking about these future prospects for detecting interstellar interlopers. And this is all based on the forthcoming Vera Rubin Observatory, specifically the LSST survey that they'll be doing. 
And I should also say that I have this NSF postdoctoral fellowship, and I also have an, an official affiliation with LSST as a SUNY scholar at Cornell. And this LSST telescope is going to be completely revolutionary. And what I'm showing you is a drone fly around from just a few months ago. So I really want to show you the entirety of this video because it's really remarkable to see how far the observatory has come while it's been planned for many years. This observatory is going to give us almost five, probably three to four orders of magnitude increase in sensitivity to transient objects in the solar system while observing the entire Southern hemisphere almost every night. And with this amazing increase in sensitivity, we will for sure get more detections of interstellar objects and things like dark comets and possibly other mysterious objects in the inner solar system. But we've quantified that already while we're waiting for, oh, and I should also, I wanted to say that the first, this thing, this is very far along. The first light is going to be in 2024. So in 2024, we will have the first, not a data release, but early science data to make sure everything is working. And by 20, in 2025, the entire LSST survey is going to happen. So this is very imminent that we'll be discovering more of these objects and we can quantify this. So I have the student Devin Hoover who did a senior thesis with me at the University of Chicago. And Devin simulated the entire population of interstellar objects like Oumuamua, integrated their trajectories, and then found out how many objects LSST is going to find. So what we're showing here, this is a sky plot showing you where LSST is most likely to observe an interstellar object. This is LSST's field of view in red. And we flag any object that comes into LSST's field of view and is bright enough to be seen as a detection. And the upshot is that LSST is going to be finding at least 20 objects like Oumuamua over 10 years, maybe many more if they have cometary activity. And an exciting thing to end on is that an interception mission to an object like Oumuamua, if we had had LSST online, would have been feasible. So if we had had LSST online, what I'm showing you in blue is the Earth. Red is the trajectory of a Muamua. LSST would have discovered a Muamua much before when we actually discovered it, somewhere around here. And if we had launched a mission, a space rendezvous, this hypothetical rendezvous shown here, in July 25th, on July 25th of 2017, we would have been able to rendezvous with a delta V of just four kilometers per second, which is precedented with respect to solar system missions. And so what Devin's showing here is in terms of delta V, which is how much you, speed you need to get, change in velocity you need to give a rocket to reach one of the objects that will be detected by LSST, this plot is showing the cumulative distribution function. So what this is, is how much, how what fraction of the population that LSST finds will be reachable. So if you say reachable is something like 10 or 15 kilometers per second, your answer ends up being that about one in five to one in 20 of the objects detected by LSST will be suitable rendezvous targets for an interception mission. So what that means is that over the course of the LSST 10 year survey, we will detect at least one, but probably a couple of targets for a dedicated mission. And Joe Lazio who just spoke and I were have been working, we were spent a week in California on a concept study for something very similar. I also wanna mention, I was just, in Flagstaff for the Asteroid Comets and Meteors Conference and also the LSST Solar System Col Science Collaboration Meeting, where what we're doing in this collaboration is trying to get make sure that we are ready, that we have everything working on the data analysis and announcement side, so that when LSST comes online, we will be able to discover objects rapidly and get that those announcements out, out to the community. And I want to say that this is a picture of all of us at um, in, at the Flagstaff meeting, but we welcome collaborators, especially they are developed. They are just now developing a techno signature think tank or subgroup. So please come and talk to me if you're interested in getting involved. I wrote that at the bottom here, thinking I would be there with you and you could come and talk to me physically. Unfortunately, that's not possible. But if you want to email me or anything like that, my email is at the bottom here, and I'm happy to talk about the LSST Solar System Science collaboration. Um, and I'll just leave my main takeaways up here and end because I think I am just out of time. Thank you very much. 
and I wish I could be there in person.